How's it going now? I'm Matthew Gilbert. Noah Averitt, Lou Gomer. And I'm Anish Patel, and we're going to be presenting Genuine Parts Company. We are pitching a hold on GPC because we believe, based on our target price around $136, that GPC is fairly valued with the current price around $126, which provides an upside of approximately 7.2%. This is a very close return comparatively to a cost of equity, which is the economic basis for an investment. There, there are three main factors behind for a reason for our hold, as GPC's historical downside protection, historically low beta, and consistent dividends. GPC operates in 15 countries across three geographic locations, North America, Europe, and Australasia, Asia, employing over 50,000 people across a network of 10,000 locations while actively engaging in strategic transactions. GPC has two revenue segments, the automotive parts group, and the industrial parts group. The automotive parts group accounts for approximately 66% of total net sales operating in three geographic locations, uh, <coughs> selling over a half million replacement parts and accounting for 8% of the global market share. The industrial parts group operates under the banners Motion Industries, uh, accounting for approximately 34% of total net sales, selling over 10 million replacement parts operating in North America and Australia, Asia, while having over 170,000 MRO and OEM customers while holding 3% of the global market share. Auto part wholesale activities roughly make up 53% of all revenue generated by GPC. The second largest operating segment being industrial, contributing about 34%, and the smallest retail, about 13%. About 80% of all net sales in the automotive aftermarket industry are done through informing where consumers go to service providers for repairs, and do it yourself makes up about 20%. In a five-year historic period, do it for me can be seen having a 3% average annual growth rate as opposed to 1.4% for do-it-yourself. We have identified four drivers that can influence industry revenue. Average age of automobile, per capita disposable income, the industrial production index, and demand for primary metal manufacturing. Cons uh, disposable income has a unique relationship with industry revenue in the sense that during times of recession, consumers might not have the confidence to purchase new vehicles, therefore they may be more interested in repairing and maintaining existing vehicles. And during times of expansion or optimism, some consumers might be interested in upgrading their vehicle as opposed to replacing it. Therefore, the demand for non-essential parts can increase, which can help industry revenue. Comparing GPC to its relative peer group on evaluation basis, you can see that their PE of around 20 is slightly high, or slightly lower than the, than the relative peer group. Um, historically, over a 10-year average of around 19, they're slightly higher than this. Looking at price of sales, they're much more fair, fairly valued than the relative peer group. How do we think this is due to their lower operating profit margins? As you can see, GPC has much lower operating profit margin than their relative peer group. We think this is because of their focus on the B2B model, which has tighter margins than the B2C model of some of their competitors. Operational efficiency is critically important within these industries. As you can see, GPC has superior asset and inventory turnover. This brings up the idea that they are mitigating inventory holding costs, while also using their assets more efficiently than competitors to generate revenue. Looking at debt, they have comparable levels of debt to equity to peers. However, their debt to assets is much lower, which brings up the idea that they could potentially take on more debt in order to increase ROE. We have identified three main risks as being the most relevant to investors, with those being online retailing, inflation, and labor costs. As you can see, automotive parts sales are expected to continue to increase over the next few years, but more and more of those coming from online sources. Currently, as we said before, 80% of all auto parts sales are done do it for me, and GPC capitalized on this by primarily selling to professional service providers that require just-in-time delivery. If these service providers are willing to wait an extended period of time, they can get a better price. Uh, in order to mitigate some of this uh, downside risk, GPC has partnered with PartsTech to supply their inventories and to expand their e-commerce reach. Inflation is one of the hottest topics on all of investors' minds at the moment, uh, and we believe that there are three main reasons why GPC may be able to pass along these inflated costs. As you can see, auto part specific CPI has greatly increased over the overall CPI index, and auto part PPI trails the overall PPI index. This brings up the idea that the demand for these goods is relatively more inelastic than other discretionary goods, and that consumers are willing to pay these inflated costs. Uh, secondly, although maybe due to seasonality, GPC has been able to increase gross margins over the last year. And finally, consumers have relatively low bargaining power within this industry, as these goods are a necessity for them. GPC operates in a very labor-intensive industry, with labor costs making up around 5 to 7% of total costs. As seen on the beverage curve, the job openings rate is at an all-time high uh, <coughs> comparatively to the unemployment rate. This serves as a confirmation for the labor shortage we are currently experiencing, and businesses will likely have to increase wages in order to incentivize workers. Moving to ESG, more specifically environmental, from 2018 to 2020, GPC has seen a reduction in their over overall energy consumptions. However, this is likely due to early shutdowns in 2020, as there was an increase in overall consumptions in 2019. To further reduce and track, uh, to further reduce and track um, energy, 
overall energy consumption. GBC plans to set scientific-based targets this year. Uh, in order to continue to expand their green efforts, GPC has expanded into renewable energy with the majority coming from nuclear. Moving to social, GPC has many programs to, uh, to support its communities, with the most influential being the Motion Supplier Diversity Program. This program has increased the spending into small women, veteran, and black-owned businesses, along with its hub zone suppliers by 32% from 2019 to 2020. One area we believe GPC could see improvement is by, is by diversifying their U.S. managers, as there's a 16% discrepancy. And finally, for governance, GPC has very high levels of institutional ownership, with the three largest accounting for 22% of total outstanding shares. This is very important because they have a large presence when it comes to voting and initiatives set by the board. <clears throat> there are two members of the board that are not independent, with one being the CEO, Paul Donahue, who also serves as the executive chairman. Uh, this is also a potential red flag as there is the possibility of inadequate oversight of the executive management team. Moving into the financial analysis, over the past six years, GPC has grown revenues at the rate of 1.52%. Due to the industrial segment's expansion into Australasia, the resurgence of the overall economy, and the continuation <coughs> of GPC's strategic bulk on acquisitions, we project revenues to grow at a rate of 2.3% to 2024. Over a five-year period, GPC's revenue sourced from the U.S. decreased by 17% and increased by the same overseas. Most notably, GPC acquired Alliance Automotive Group, Europe's second largest auto, auto parts distributor in 2019, and expanded their industrial segment into Australasia in 2020. Over, over the past six years, GPC has grown dividends at a rate of around 4%, earning them a leading spot amongst the dividend aristocrats for 66 years of continuous dividend increases. Additionally, they have the second highest dividend yield amongst their competitors at 2.37%. With a coverage ratio of around 175%, only decreasing at a rate of around 2%, we believe that the firm can reliably maintain future increases in dividend payouts. Supporting the notion of taking on more debt, GBC, by, by issuing two new bonds at $500 million each and selling $200 million of accounts receivables, GPC acquired Cayman Distribution Group in January of 2022, increasing their industrial market share to 4%. Motion Industries currently operates through over 500 locations in the U.S. This will be increased by around a third with Cayman adding 220 new locations. Um, while not only contributing an estimated $1.1 in revenues for 2022, Cayman's added locations will assist in increasing operational efficiencies. In their most recent earnings report, uh, GPC announced a 14% increase in revenues from 2020 to 2021, the largest growing factor being online retailing. Uh, for the remaining projected years, we used conservative estimates based on historical averages to project a growth rate of around 2% to 2024. Operating expenses will largely be affected by two factors in the coming years, SG&A expenses being increased by labor shortages and hourly income increases, and the same being decreased by the previously discussed Cayman acquisition. Uh, we projected these expenses to grow at a rate of around 4% to 2024. With an overall free cash flow growth rate of around 5% over the past nine years, we have a base case for the DCF of around $133. In the price target calculation, the PE and the comparable companies methods were weighted at 30%, and the DCF was weighted at 40% to produce a base case price target of $136.04. The DCF was weighted more because we believe that it's the most theoretically sound method to value in this business. We conducted a Monte Carlo simulation to ensure that our price targets fall within a reasonable range. The issue with the Monte Carlo simulation is that it assumes from value within the market. However, as you can see, both GPC and SP500 overall do not follow a normal pattern. However, we use this as a reality check to ensure that our price target falls within a reasonable range. And finally, for our recommendation, we are recommending a hold because we believe GPC is fairly valued, providing an approximate upset of 7.2%, with the positive speed, historical downside protection, active strategic transactions, favorable financial metrics, and expanding ESG initiatives, with the negatives being weak profitability, increasing labor costs, and low industry growth. One minute remaining. Thank you. That'll be all. question. Um, we're all hearing so much about the, the investment that the auto companies are all making in electric vehicles. How, how did you factor in the industry transition from ICE to electric vehicles in your analysis of the future profitability of Jim and Clark's? 
to your question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, moving forward, um, electric vehicles um, serve as an opportunity for GPC. Um, currently as it is, primarily uh, it is all, all done in-house, as seen with like the Tesla and these sorts of things. These are OEM parts and these manufacturers or these suppliers as a GPC are as in, aren't as involved in this. However, moving forward, um, GPC can see expansion of this. Uh, EV serves as an opportunity for them to grow going forward. So I think moving forward, uh, we have implemented this into revenue growth. However, expectation of EV even over the next 10 years um, is almost minimal. But don't electric vehicles have fewer parts than ICE vehicles? So if more of the new cars have are electric, will they need fewer parts from GPC? Um, yes, that is true that um, they would need fewer parts. However, these parts are more expensive, so there is um, kind of a uh, compromise or like balancing out effect and could increase margins for them. Thank you. Yes. So uh, you mentioned that expenses are supposed to grow 4% a year, mm -hmm. but revenue is growing at uh, significantly lower than that. <coughs> How, is, do you see them closing the gap at some point, the gap widening? Yeah, so the revenue projections that we have on there um, were extremely conservative relative to their historical averages. Um, I think historical average was a little bit below 3%, and ours were just slightly above that. Um, though when we were looking at some analyst reports, um, some analysts do project uh, a little bit higher than what we have. Um, so while what is shown um, is going to be, there's going to be uh, cost pressures towards margins, um, but I think that's something that rather than us pitching a buy, that's what brings us down to a hold. So you think there's limited opportunity for them to control expense, to bring down the expense growth? Um, yes, I, I think limited, but uh, as I discussed with the Cayman acquisition, I do think that's going to be a contributing factor. Um, the only downside is we don't really know how much it's going to contribute yet. Thank you. You put the majority, or you put the most significant weight on the DCF method. Can we unpack that a little bit? Two of the major variables are your um, assumptions on <coughs> rates of return and on cash flow margins. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so with regards to the weighting, um, because the, yeah, if you want to go to the appendix slide. Um, pull up, yeah, so pull up the evaluation for first. DCF, so, please. Yeah. So it's two down. Two down. Um, yeah, this slide's fine. So, I'm sorry, could you repeat the phrase you Could you unpack your DCF a little bit? The uh, two yeah. major assumptions are WAC calculations and margins. Sure. So with regards to the WAC calculation, um, cost of equity, we used a 20-year risk-free rate um, that is currently 2.36%. Um, equity risk premium by Estimating the expected and in, in long-term inflation, um, incorporating the terminal growth and the um, current dividend yield. That's how we got to our long-term equity risk premium, uh, giving us a cost of equity of 8%, um, of course, using their 1.02 beta. Um, and then the pre-tax cost of debt is using their cur three currently outstanding bonds, um, and they're weighted evenly because they're $500 million each, um, and using their uh, current effective tax rate gives us a cost of debt of 1.66%, um, then using the weightings of their equity and debt, if the WAC of 6.87%. And that's their current capital structure? Mm -hmm. With debt equity at that level, you didn't assume they would be expanding, you didn't get any, any information from management about whether they'll be expanding or contracting their debt? Um, no, that's their current capital structure. So that's what they said, they're going to keep it pretty much the same. Well, they, they seem to maintain a um, pretty typical debt to equity spread around this range, and um, this incorporates the new debt that was just added on with the Cayman uh, acquisition. So they've just recently brought on debt, and it is, we believe, unlikely that they would take on more. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that you relied most heavily on your GCF analysis that you just discussed, discussed with us. Why did you Why did you think that was the most important input? Yeah. So, um, actually, you don't have to put it here. Um, the 
PE and the comparable competitors valuations, um, we believe that the, well, with regards to the DCF, we believe that it provides a more holistic review of the company. And of course, any investment is the present value of future cash flows. Um, and so that's why this one was weighted at 40% relative to the 30% of the other two. Um, in addition, the PE valuation, um, it really only includes the, uh, here, actually go to the model, that's what I wanted to see. Um, <laughs> Up, 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 there. Yeah, so this only includes 10-year historical, competitor average PE, current PE, and then a forward PE. Um, and because it only includes just, we're comparing that to a 2022 projected EPS value, it's not really um, as holistic as we believe that the DCF is. How much do you think the current, the past couple of years distorted your uh, model, if at all, or how did, how did you account? for all the strangeness of the last couple of years. So with regards to that, um, for our uh, earnings projections, if we go to, I think it's right at the next slide. Yeah, so for our earnings projections, <coughs> for 2020, you'll see that the net income value isn't exactly what, um, what the number was. It was around, it was actually a negative value. The reason why it is that is, um, there were a lot of uh, non I guess, occurring yeah. There's a goodwill impairment. Yeah, there was there's pretty high goodwill impairment and things that weren't really gonna be projectable or things that happen not every single year. And so we sort of did a, an adjusted income statement for that just so that we could get the consistency of looking at the things that happen um, at the rates that they do rather than looking at I know that's not the best way to say that, but um, rather than looking at the things that are gonna be really difficult to project. Thank you. And what did you say were the strengths of this particular investment? I thought I heard a couple of Is there um, historical downside protection, historically low beta, because this is going to pay out. I had one other question. You mentioned the role of e commerce, and yet a very high percentage of the company's sales currently are through bricks and mortar. Could you talk a little bit more about how you think that that evolution in sales practices is going to impact the company going forward? Yeah. And how, how, maybe go back to that slide and just talk yeah. to us a little bit more about which, what you're thinking there and what does that really mean for profitability? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the biggest thing within this industry is that um, 80% of it is do it for me. So these are customers going to professional service providers and they're doing the services for them. Um, and then additionally, um, as we move towards e-commerce and these sorts of things, uh, this is, uh, I personally believe, a bigger risk to the, the B2C um, type companies, your AutoZone and O'Reilly, uh, which has seen um, a loss in revenue as online uh, shopping has increased. Uh, but as GPC primarily sells to these professional service providers that require just-in-time delivery, um, they can do this through their expensive distribution network where online, um, online companies can't you know, get the parts uh, within the time that they need. These service providers are trying to maximize auto bays and they're trying to get parts in, cars out. So as GPC has built up this distribution network, they can do that. So there's a kind of uh, downside protection there from that. And then additionally, uh, partnering with Parts Tech to expand their e-commerce reach to supplying their inventories. And uh, additionally, over the past year, uh, GPC, um, the online retail for them has been the fastest growing at around 40%. So. One minute remaining. Did you get any indication that there could be a potential acquirer? Uh, is there anybody accumulating shares in this company? Could there be an extra return from that? Um, from what we've seen, um, that is not something that we believe, particularly in the realm of possibilities. There is a, a large portion of institutional ownership. However, it is um, kind of broken apart. Do you want to go to that slide? slide. Uh, it's going to be the so governance. The governance. governance. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, the, the, the largest shareholder is going to be Vanguard at 11%, BlackRock at around 6%, and State Street around 5 um, Their primary ownership through this is through passive ETFs. Um, which, you know, they're just modeling this B500, so they're investing through that. That's time. Thank you.
very much, Team C. You did a great job.